we are having a dialogue. There is a conversation between two people, friendly, serious, and wanting to solve their own intimate personal problems. And so they talk, they go for a walk in the woods and talk over things together. And we are in that position, you and I, the speaker and you. We are out for a walk, lovely stream, marvellous pine woods, full of morning scent, and we are talking over together. And each one of us know that words have particular definite meaning, that each one of us understands the meaning of the, me of the words they use. They know the words and their content of the word, the meaning of the word, the significance of the word. So they use the word which is common to both of them. And they also know that the word is not the thing and the words do not actually convey the deep inner feelings. They are feeling it out together. Well, they're good friends. They're not opposed to each other. They're not trying to trick each other. <coughs> they have known each other for long years. And they have often talked about these things. And so they're willing to expose themselves to each other, point out their difficulties, their problems, <coughs> and each one is trying to understand the other and hoping to help each other. That is really a dialogue. They have established a good relationship between them. So can we? this morning, have such a dialogue. And we talked about yesterday the nature of attention, care and love. So what should we talk over together this morning? psychological uh, sort of inhibitions that we have that block us from loving. Could we? Uh, investigate why it is so difficult for us to actually experience here and now the psychological inhibitions that block us. Could we investigate why it is so difficult to look at the psychological inhibitions here and now? Could we? investigate together <coughs> our psychological inhibitions, our psychological barriers. Now, talk it over together, the gentleman asks. How can the mind be? Free of cunning intelligence that society pushes on us. How can the mind be free of cunning intelligence, society's intelligence? How can the mind be free from the cunning, uh, cunning which thought has put together there? Some 
something totally different, totally new to us, or it's something that we possess already, but we forgot. Of Could you discuss what is intelligence? Is there a difference between voluntary isolation, which obviously creates conflict, and the involuntary isolation, such as being blind, many other uh, involuntary. Uh, is there a difference between voluntary isolation and involuntary isolation? Isolation and forced isolation. Isolation through some kind of illness which is forced and voluntarily willing isolation, is that it? <coughs> Sir, why, why do you... Just a minute, madam. Sit down, sir, he is coming. Could we see the constant and mechanical activity of the brain, of the talk, the shouting all the time? Mechanical activity of the brain. Sorry. Why does thought always occur? Why is there not a freedom at any time from the movement of thought? So you tell us that fear is produced by thought, but I myself had the experience that uh, thought is uh, uh, that fear manifests itself in thought, and that it wants to structure and limit itself and to escape from itself by thinking. You say for fear is a result of thought, produced by thought, no, by... Thought, thought is the result of fear. Thought, Sorry. result of fear, you follow? He's putting fear first and thought afterwards, right? Yeah. Right. Identification also in connection Could with we discuss why the mind seeks identification, why we seek identification. I find it extremely difficult to take part in these um, discussions because I'm always in doubt whether it is a right or a wrong question. How can I find out myself? Are there any criteria? How, how can one find out for oneself what is a right question and a wrong question? Is that it, sir? The usual meditation is self-hypnosis. I ask that question, that question because it is only through that that I have the feeling I understand when you say uh, beauty is something entirely different. Love is something entirely different. I didn't hear that. I'm afraid we haven't understood. I ask, why do you call the usual meditation that is sitting down with closed eyes self-hypnosis? Why do you call meditation when you're sitting down with closed eyes?
What? I asked that question because I have the feeling that it is only, not only, but also through that, that I can understand when you say beauty is something entirely different. So when she does that, when she meditates, she does have a feeling of what you're saying, but beauty is something entirely different. Why do we have to see? Why, do you, why are you saying that sitting down quietly, cross-legged, closed eyes, and going through all that, <clears throat> I somehow feel that I'm very close to what you are saying. Why are you s saying that's not meditation? Why do you say self-hypnosis? Why do you say self-hypnosis? That's enough. Now, which of these shall we take up? All connected with the mind. All these questions, if you have observed, if you have listened, are dealing with the nature of thought, the nature of the mind, what is intelligence, and what is meditation. Right? Now, which of these will we take? When we go on with yesterday's talk, I have the feeling we didn't get over it completely. Could we go on discussing, talking over together yesterday's meeting? Because when the questioner says, I don't feel we have gone through completely to the very end of it. So you've got two questions, fundamental questions. Thought, with all its complexities, its mechanical habits, its constant activity, never a moment that is quiet, meditation, and what we talked about yesterday, love, intelligence, Compassion. Now, which of these do you want? <laughs> One is rather shy of that word. Because it's so spoiled. Love of God, love of my family, love of poems, go, go to a lovely walk, we follow sex. The politicians use the love of the country, love of God, love of Jesus, love of Krishna, and so on, so on, so on. So one is hesitant to use that word. So perhaps if I may suggest, we will talk about that question which you asked by inquiring first. We are discussing, we are talking over together. It's not a solitary conversation with, my, with oneself. If we could go into this question of meditation, then we may be able to understand whether it is possible for thought to be absolutely quiet and for not compelled, coerced, forced, all the rest of it. And perhaps if we could take that question and go into very, very deeply, then perhaps we can also enter into the field of what is intelligence, love, compassion, and without those, which is that the essence of that love, mind can never be totally free from all its manifestations, its trickery, its deceits and dishonesty. So, would you? Would 
Would it be all right if we talked about that? You are not pleasing me, please, I don't care. If you want to talk about something else, we will. All right, the first question, if I may ask, is it possible to keep the brain, to have a brain that is not twisted, that is not neurotic, that's very healthy, young? I'm asking that as the first question. Do you understand? I'm asking to put it very simply. Can one can the mind remain young? And not grow old? decay, corrupt, but keep its quality of youth. Youth being, please, decision, action and vitality. Right? That is generally accepted as the meaning of youth, to have Enormous amount of energy, decision, acting, and that sense of freedom. That I think would more or less would describe what is a young mind. Would you agree to that? Definition, you can change it. I'm not sticking to those words. But to have a mind that's extraordinarily clear, simple, having great energy, vitality, and capable of instant decision and action. Right? Would you agree to that? Would, that's only a definition. You can change the definition, change it how you like. But let's all agree, if we would, if you accept that, that is the quality of a mind that's young, that's not hurt, that has no problems, that is living, living, not in the future or in the past, but actually living in the present. And that's why again I said, I'm you, one is using words to convey the quality of a mind that, that is youthful. If we agree to that definition, that definition can be changed as you like. Now, how can that mind, how can we, can that mind come into being? That's the first thing. You understand my question? You're following? Sir? Um, really you your intelligence and not your mind? Huh? Wouldn't you need to use um, your body intelligence and not the, the mind? There's the intelligence of the body, the intelligence which has been spoiled by indulgence, by drugs, by alcohol, all that extravagance. And so the intelligence of the body the body has its own intelligence if left alone, not destroyed, not corrupted by taste, by desire and all the rest of it. The body has its own intelligence. 
if, if you have observed it. So we leave that for the moment. All right, I, if you must go into it much deeper, we will. Our mind is the result of our senses. Right? Right? Isn't that so? This is science, this is just natural. And we exercise not the, all the senses together. Right? Are you following me? But exaggerate one or two senses. And so there is never a balance. I do not know if you have experimented or watched this or are aware of your senses. Either one or two senses dominate and the other senses are in abeyance or not totally functioning and so there is always inequality, always imbalance. In, our, in the activity of our senses, right? You're following all this? Please do follow this. Don't go to sleep because this is, and we are coming to it. So is it possible that all our senses work together, totally harmoniously? That's the first question. And because our whole structure is based on senses, perception, taste, touch and all that. Now if there is imbalance in our senses, our brain is, our mind is affected, naturally. And from this imbalance there is neurotic activity. So, is it possible, please go into it with me, we are dialogue, I'm not giving a speech. Can we see the movement of the sky, the clouds, the shadows on the mountain, with all our senses together? You understood my question? Will you do it? As you are sitting there, observing yourself, please, as I said yesterday, unless you apply, actually apply, do it, you can sit there for the next fifty years, you will do nothing. But if you apply, actually work it out, then you will see it for yourself that as long as there is imbalance in the senses, the mind, which is also part of the senses, part of thought, then that imbalance invariably creates disharmony. Right? Do it, please, as, we, as you are observing it actually apply. Could you give a concrete example of what you mean by imbalance of the senses? What, sir? Could you give a concrete example of what you mean by imbalance of the senses? Concrete example of imbalance of the senses. I'm not good at giving examples. I think examples are wrong. Because you have to find out, if, I give, if one gives an example, that becomes the pattern. You follow? And say, I must conform to that, or no, that pattern, that example is not good, better example, and so on. We, we 
battle with examples. I hope you understand this. I can, I can think out an example. Sex. <laughs> Drugs. Various forms of sensory entertainments where only the eye or the ear functions, not the totality of all the senses. I, you understand all this? So, the mind, are you all, oh, am I talking, as the gentleman pointed out the other day, I'm performing. He said that I'm performing and you're doing excellent performance. That is, you know, which is rather an unpleasant word, but there it is. And this is a dialogue between you and me. So don't please become quiet and just listen. So that's part of the mind. The condition of the brain when we talk about the, the same mind. When we use the word mind, sir, we are using, including in the mind, all the activity of the senses, all the activities of thought, all the activities of emotion whether imagined or real, romantic, sentimental, all that, the whole of human activity is the mind. At least I look at it that way. You may, you may look at it differently, but as we are two friends talking over together, I change my uh, vocabulary, you change your words, but we mean the same thing. That is, the mind is contains, holds all the senses, all the emotions, all the romantic, sentimental attitudes, values, and also the enormous complexity of thought, the memories, the experiences, the hurts, the wounds that one has received from childhood, psychologically, inwardly, and the intention, the motive, the drive, the desires, all that is the mind. The current to this love, part of the mind. You understand the question? Is love? contained in the mind. What do you say? Dialogue, please. Huh? No? Question the lady says, it is not in the mind. Then is it outside the mind? Go, so go into it for yourself. It's a dialogue. And perhaps it is a part of love. Come on. Perhaps the mind is a part of love. Perhaps the mind is part of love. Mind is part of love. You go very carefully into this, please. You think it out, so go into dialogue. Is love remembrance? Huh? No, go into it, madam. Just look at it. I'm telling you something I'm asking you. 
Is love something that has happened and you remember it? Therefore I'm asking, is love part of remembrance? You are being kind to me, I remember it, and therefore I have affection for you. Or you have, you know, remember it. Is love a remembrance? If it is not, is it then within the within the structure and nature of the mind? You're, this is a very difficult question, please don't just slip it by. That's why I want to go into this carefully. Is we have defined more or less that definition can be changed the nature of the mind, with all the senses, so on and so on. And all this is predominated by thought, right? That is the central activity, right? That controls the senses, exaggerates the senses, gives importance to a certain sense and not to the others, that creates images, conclusions, aggressiveness, assertiveness, all that is the activity of thought, right? So thought predominates all our activity including the senses, inclu dominating the, act, the intelligence of the body. You are following all this? So thought is the central factor that is constantly operating, controlling, deciding, changing, modifying, pursuing, establishing a goal and driving towards that. And the past, with all its memories, anxiety, all that is, the whole of that is the activity of the mind, which is thought, right? You are quite sure? And please discuss with me, please. The same sensation to the mind. All the senses give the same sensation to the mind. All the senses give the sense. All the senses in the mind are equal. Same, same value. The mind, but the thought says this is better than that. That's all. We are saying. That. Thought is, thought is consuming the senses, and no. the senses become dull. When thought exercises dominates, senses become dull. Do we, have, could we come move from this, right, sir? Right, can we move on? Now, meditation, is part of thinking, otherwise you wouldn't meditate, right? Would you? No?
Au dessus, c'est malade. The bully bully. But first seeing the moon. Start meditating, sitting quietly, closing your eyes, is the activity of thought. Force, because you want to achieve or feel good in that position, doing something. Right? So thought has brought this about through desire. No? Please, this is not very complex. I sit in in that position, cross-legged or what is called the lotus position, close my eyes, because I, I have been taught or I have read or I have heard somebody that if you do this, you will have a marvellous experience. No, sir. Huh? I do it, but only to watch my thoughts. I, really? That's a different matter, sir. That's a, you see the difference? I do it because I want to achieve certain experience, because I've read about it or I've been told about it, and it gives you certain pleasure. I feel rather relieved, relaxed. Right? Right? And that, that I maintain that giving more and more importance to my feeling of certain pleasure, certain experience, certain uh, state of mind. Hmm? And I go on doing it. But the origin of that is the movement of thought. Right? But, but this is the practice of meditation. What's up? What, what you're talking about is the practice of meditation, but within this practice, meditation can appear, which is something else. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about, well, as I feel, is a practice. But within this practice, the meditation can happen. But there is a difference between the word uh, meditation, what it is exactly. Huh? This is the practice of meditation. And within this, this practice, suddenly something else could happen. Yes, yeah, this is suddenly, this is the practice of meditation, and in that something suddenly can happen. Right? Right, sir? Yeah, now what happens is really meditation. I mean, it's just a question of words. <coughs> what happens is really meditation. I mean, sir, <laughs> we are investigating, right? You are jumping to conclusion. You are saying it happens. I question the whole thing. Sir, when we sit quietly to watch our mind, after a while our eyes naturally shut, get shut, and we become quiet. We don't sit with our eyes in the purpose of the shut and so as to come. Sir, I have got, the speaker has played with all this, right? This is not something new you are telling me. So have patience. I have been through all this, sitting quietly, breathing, repeating, hoping for something to happen. <laughs> no. You are not meeting my point. Why do I meditate? Why does one meditate? Because I'm agitated by the question. What? Because I'm agitated. When there is an agitation. When we are agitated, nervous, <coughs> anxious, crowded with innumerable problems, by sitting quietly, hmm, we hope to get away slightly from that. Not hope, sir. 
what? Yeah, just relax before till they were overcome again. Yeah. But you, you're missing, forgive me, you're missing my point of view, what I'm saying, which is, all this is the origin of thought, origin of desire, no? Right, sir? Why are you hesitant? What's wrong with it? Can the man, can, uh, can dog not, not see his own uselessness and slightly stop? Because it, it see, it is useless. <coughs> you seem to think, Madame and the others, that I'm opposed to meditation. I am totally, completely opposed to the meditation that you're all doing. Because that's not meditation. As I've been through all this. Maybe we must investigate what you mean by meditation. The others mean another thing. We explain what the word means, my dear. The word means to think over, to ponder, to investigate, to pay at concentrate in order to look at your problems and all that is involved in that one word. What the one is doing, what is called meditation, is not meditation. All right. It's the same thing, so I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying what one considers meditation, if you are willing to examine what the other person has to say, say that's not meditation. Meditation is something much more complex, more etc. So, but what, are, what one, two friends talking about me, I'm not opposing you. We are talking this over. We say meditation begins with desire, with thought. Right? You hear somebody from Tibet, from India, from Zen, from God knows what other place, and he expounds what meditation is. He said, do it, sit down quietly, I'll give you a system to make you calm, re restful, relaxed. So your thought accepts it, desire to achieve it, and you sit in that position. Right? This is so obvious. What are you objecting to? Because the idea started the meditation, all the meditation is only an idea. That's right, sir. That's what I'm saying differently. So, meditation begins with thought, right? And desire says, I must achieve that, something which I have experienced yesterday in the sitting quietly, and I want that. I want it to continue. I practice. I force. I follow a system. All the activity of thought. That's all. What are you objecting to? Sometimes, sir, I, I meditate to go out from identification. Identification. I have meditated a couple of hours, the questioner says, to get away from myself. Right? Is meditation an escape? 
What's that? Temporary relief. Then take a drug. Take a night, that thing that puts you, you know, to quieten the, your nerves. You see, you are you, sir, you are not following all this. You are wasting time. Temporary relief, temporary excitement, temporary experience, temporary quietness, all that you call meditation. My Lord, well, how that word has been misused. Could it be that uh, <coughs> could we get on with it a little bit? Could it be that oh, one cannot force meditation? I suppose that you are doing just the same. You say that you want to be free, and therefore you look uh, about your about your feelings, huh? and you go inside. What, sir? I suppose it's just the same with you. Oh. You say you want to be free, and therefore you look at your at your problems and go inside. I am not, sir. I'm sorry, you are misunderstood. I'm not doing that. Could it be that one cannot force meditation, one is brought to meditation? Sir, so could we stick to one thing? We are asked, we are saying, we are asking, we have gone so far, which is, what is the nature of the mind? We talked about that. And that mind is dominated by thought. Thought is perpetually in an activity. When you are sleeping, when you are awake, when you are walking, when you are by yourself, it is constantly moving. And that becomes a strain, right? That becomes uh, nervous. And to bring about a quietness, a relief, a sense of peace, you try to meditate, quote, meditation, and achieve a little bit of that, and you practice, and you call that meditation. I say that, please, that's not meditation. It's something much wider, deeper, it, that requires a great deal of inquiry. So please listen. Exchange, not say meditation is this, meditation is that, it appeals to me, it doesn't appeal to me. That's all. That's, we stop discussing. Whereas we say, look, let's find out. Right? Krishna Ji, I admit, I don't know what meditation is. Could we go into what meditation is? I'm doing it, sir. <laughs> is it possible to know what meditation is at all? Is it possible to know what meditation is at all? To know at all what meditation is? Yes, sir, that's what I'm saying. Could, could we put it this way? When you deliberately set about to meditate, it's not meditation. Right? Because behind that deliberate act is desire. Behind that is a thought having come to a conclusion, pursuing that conclusion. We say that's not meditation. You may say, you're wrong. I said, all right, let's talk it over. So thought dominates, right? That's simple and clear, no? All our activity, whether you meditate, whether you sit down, you practice, you try to force the mind to be quiet, all that is still the activity of thought. And has, is love the activity of thought? Right? Go on, sir. Let's talk it over. Is, is the activity of thought 
or rather does the activity of thought bring about right relationship between two people? Because if you haven't established right relationship with, with one another, you, you can sit on your <laughs> legs crossed for the rest of your life. Unless you lay the foundation of, of relationship, having no conflict and so on, so on, any form of meditation is just an escape into another series of illusions. So, is love the activity of hope? I love you. I really do. Isn't this strange? Is it love the absence of love? So you're thinking about what some of us have done, you probably do not love it. How sad it is. So therefore, um, somebody said. Somebody comes and tells you, I love you, old boy, or old, I love you. You don't go on with your thinking, do you? You just listen to me. You don't. So isn't that... Um, I don't know. <laughs> so isn't that the You're all life? so infantile. And we are asking, is love the activity of hope? Is love the activity of the senses? Is love the activity of desire? Please find out, investigate in your life. When you are controlled, when your sex becomes all important, which is the activity of the senses. One must be aware of this activity then. <laughs> One has to be aware, sir, but first know the nature of one's mind. No, through awareness you will discover this. That is, means you have to look at it. Look at your desires, the sensory desires, wanting food, the taste of food, the compulsive eating food of a certain kind because it tastes nice. <coughs> having exercising certain capacity of the iris, optical, seeing something always, or sensory responses of sex. These are the dominant factors in our life, and you are trying to move away from that. And if I may try to answer your question, Love can be, and can only be, the product of thought. The type of thinking, I don't know so. The type of thinking... So, you, are you saying, sir, thought is part of love? No, I said it. I just said it. Love can be... Because love is the product of thought. Love is the product of thought. <laughs> so love can be, it can only be the product of the type of thinking. So, when you say it can, it can only be, it must be, you have already come to a conclusion. We have stopped investigating. You asked the question whether love is the product of thought. Yes, is love part of thought? 
which means that love contains the whole movement and the complex complexity of thought. You understand? But if it contains thought, is that love? Don't even go into it, look at it. I don't know the word in English, but I know it in French. I think it is letter in French. I don't know who knows it in English. Or Zustand in German. State. State. A state, a fact. I'm afraid I'm to come here the same. Ah, steady, you are using Sanskrit. I want to care. I'm, I'm always really good at doing this. Sir? Oh. I We don't. You are still. We've gone beyond this, madam. Please go on. I just want to ask you a question about meditation, if I may. Uh, I have either been under the illusion or delusion that the meditation in which I do is done to me effortlessly. Now, is this my illusion completely? He says that he meditates effortlessly. Is that an illusion? Yes. Therefore, you must understand before, when you say, I meditate effortlessly, <coughs> what do you mean by that word effort? I lie down and the process begins within, in which all I need to do is release the, my, my thinking process to it. I don't make any effort to release, it just happens. So when you know you are meditating, it is not meditation. Have you listened to what I said, sir? Yes, sir. When you know you are meditating, it is not meditation. Yeah, you, you don't know. I don't know <laughs> that is meditation. You don't see the beauty of all this. You are just going on and on and on. I'm trying to find out. meditate at all? You have never even asked that question. What you call meditation, why do you do it? Is it that they brought it from India, from Tibet, from Japan, <coughs> and you like to play with it? Sir, when one is angry, for example, when I have been angry, or I have a problem, I'm in conflict, if I do what we are both agree, it's not meditation, but just sitting down by what my thoughts. Yes, sir, that is just when you are angry. <coughs> to examine, to go into it is not meditation. It is not meditation, but it is useful for Yes, sir, yes, sir, I agree. To be aware that you have been angry, to be to go into the whole question of anger, that's not meditation. Not the meditation that you are talking about. <coughs> I say, when you know you are meditating, it's not meditation. Mm. Swallow that pill and look. Can love itself take me away? from the realm of thought. Meditation helps me to get away from myself, from my thought. Then go to the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> can love itself help me?
Can love take him away from the realm of hope? You understand the question? Can love bring about freedom from the realm of hope? You know? Can love free the mind from the activities of hope. What do you say? Don't look at me. What do you say? Sir, it's a very good question. The mind is incessantly active, sleeping, waking, daydreaming, sitting quietly. When it's not under control, pop comes the thought in. So does love free the mind from the activities of thought? No. You see what you have done? You are using love as a means of escape from thought. But if you have understood the nature of thought, please follow this. The, and thought gives its own right place, then it you don't have to move away from it. Thought has established itself in its right place. Do you understand this? Then for love is not an, an escape or an avoidance or moving away from thought. Is that meditation? <laughs> huh? Is that meditation, he asked. Huh? He asked, was that meditation? <laughs> so, as I said, when you know you are meditating, right, sitting in that position, breathing, repeating a mantra, all that, when there is that activity, it's not meditation. I will tell you why, if you will listen. All that is the activity of desire and hope. Obvious. A guru comes along. I don't know why they do, unfortunately they do. <laughs> comes along and he says, do this and you'll have the most marvelous experience of God or of enlightenment. You'll have extraordinary experience. And he lays down certain systems, methods, practices. And we being gullible, not having the quality of scepticism to question him, we say, all right, Swami or Lord or whatever you call him, and we practice it. And in the very practicing of it, you have certain quietness, certain experience, and that delights you. He said, Lord, I've got something. Right? And I say, that is the activity of desire, activity of thought which has projected an image of something to be experienced. And that, it, that image can be experienced only through certain practices certain repetition of words, especially in senses, that sounds far better. And so you repeat it. But it is still the activity of hope and desire. So unless you understand this, 
that what is the nature of thought, what is the nature of desire, gone into it, given its right play, thought, thought and thought gives itself its right place, then we be everlastingly battling with thought, with all the images that it has created. That's very simple. No? Huh? Is love denied by thought? Is love denied? Is it covered over? There was not thought. Would there be love? When there is, he's asked. When there is thought, is there love? No. But if there is no thought, you can be in an state of amnesia. You do. getting worse and worse. <laughs> is psychoanalysis a form of meditation? <laughs> Do you know what psychoanalysis is? Investigating into the past. Psychoanalysis. Analyzing oneself either by the professional, psychotherapist, psychologist, psychoanalyst, Freudian, Jungian, uh, Adlerian, or names innumerable, or you investigate yourself, analyze yourself. Huh? Who is the analyzer and what is he analyzing? He is not the analyzer, the an analyzed. So he's playing a trick on himself. You don't see all this. So anal analysis, either psychotherapeutic, of in various group therapies, uh, you know, all that going on, various forms of psychotherapy is not meditation. Good Lord. Think what we have reduced meditation to. Observation, where we are, uh, have talking about ten days, is that not also doubt? Madam, as we explained earlier in these talks, there is only observation, not the observer, right? Huh? You are saying that, agreeing to that? Do you know what that means, Madam? The absence of me, the absence of all the past, just to observe, without the word, without the name, without association, without remembrance, just to observe. You make mention of a process. We have said that process. There is no process. You see, that's what I'm pointing out here. Moment there is a process for meditation, that process is the result of thought. And thought has laid down the process in order to achieve something. You people don't listen. You never decide to start uh, meditating? What? You never decide to start meditating. How do you start meditating, in other words? Do I, do, does the speaker decide to meditate? Does the speaker decide to meditate? Do you meet meditation? I've answered the question. You people are okay. I have, We have said, sir, that when you decide to start meditation, it is not meditation. When you put yourself in the hands of another who will teach you how to meditate, it is not meditation. When you follow a system, it is not meditation. 
When you accept the authority of another and say, I know you don't know, I will tell you what to do, it's not meditation. And so on, so on, so on. That's right. That's right. When you, the lady says, as you're walking in the wood quietly, not carrying all the burdens of your problem, suddenly you have a certain sensation, feeling, and you're watching it, and thought comes over and takes charge and says, makes into memory and wanting it more. All that's not meditation. Is it a law? Is that law? <coughs> Just to observe, you say, is that law? Is, is pure observation love? See, if, look, sir, have you observed that way pure observation? Is that law? <coughs> to observe without remembrance, without naming, without a conclusion, just to observe. We have spent an hour and a quarter nearly <coughs> discussing verbally what is meditation, what is love. We haven't come to anything. Huh? I am not. <laughs> oh, delight. says, in essence, that there is a thought which is unconditioned. There is a thought or there is thinking which is unconditioned. I don't know anything about it. So the lady said, <laughs> Is there a thought which is not conditioned? Is there a thought which is not limited? There may be, but I wouldn't call it thought. Right? Thought, as is generally understood, is the process of thinking. Thinking is the movement of memory, movement of experience, movement of knowledge. 
the whole process of that is thinking. Huh? I don't see it as solely as you describe it. Right, sir. I would ask you, what is the word intuition? Intuition can be the project, can be projected by desire. Not solely. You won't even listen. It is so impossible to discuss this. When you are so definite about your point of view, then I'm afraid one be it becomes a barrier. One doesn't investigate the other. May I finish this strange dialogue up to now we've had? We started out by asking, what is the relationship of thought to meditation and to love, right? We went into the question that our mind contains or is the result of the senses, the emotions, crooked, Say, irrational, illusory, and so on. The sentiments, the judgments, the evaluations, the memories, the hurts, the anxieties, all that which is under the umbrella of thought. Thought is the central fact. And as thought is the result of knowledge, and knowledge is always limited, and therefore with knowledge goes ignorance, thought is fragmented, broken up, limited. And when thought says, I must meditate, I must find out truth, I must achieve enlightenment, thought is playing games with itself. That's obvious. So meditation has nothing to do with thought. When you sit down and deliberately meditate, it may be pleasant, it may give you certain relaxation, it may have, you may have certain ex pleasurable experience, but all that is a deliberate action by thought and desire to achieve a certain result. Therefore, that's not meditation. And what is the relationship of thought to love? That's what you're asking me. Love, this becomes rather difficult. Love is free from thought. Love is not the product of thought. If it is, it's still part of desire, obviously. So love, is independent, is free from all the activities and chicanery, dishonesty, desire, desires, sensations, sex. That's not love. Where love is, the me is not. Obviously. The me, the ego, with all its arrogance, conceits, aggressiveness, humility, pretension humility rather, all that is the me, is the ego. What has that got to do with love? You understand? So 
So love is beyond thought. Now, then, what is the relationship between meditation and love? When one deliberately, purposefully, actively participates in the so-called meditation, that meditation leads to illusion, and that illusion has no relationship with love. But there is a meditation, if you are interested in it, which is not deliberate, which has nothing whatsoever to do with desire. There is a meditation which must be totally undesired, totally free of thought. And to find that meditation, I'm not offering it as a reward if you're interested in it. You have to go into the question of desire, give it its right place, whether desire has any place at all. And also, thought has to find its own place and remain there. Then Meditation becomes something totally different from what you're doing. That is, one has to find out what is reality and what is truth. Reality is also illusion. You understand? Reality are these mountains, the hills, the groves, the meadows, the river. That's reality, you can see it. And also reality is the, all the illusions, like nationality, like your beliefs, your dogmas, your rituals, your saviors, your Krishnas, your all that. These are all illusions. They may have ever existed, might, but what we have made of them is illusion. That's a reality. Going to a church, into a temple, into a mosque, that's a reality. That's all the product of thought. Right? Of course. So, reality has to be understood, seen. Reality, everything that thought has created, the atom bomb, it exists, atom exists before thought investigated and created the bomb. Thought did not create nature, but thought has used nature. The chair one is sitting on is made by thought out of wood. And reality has nothing, truth has nothing whatsoever to do with reality. That, to find that is meditation. To f begin to, to establish right relationship with human beings, not the everlasting battle between sexes, between human beings, between killing each other, terrorizing each other, destroying the earth, and so on, so on. If we don't stop that, what's the good of your meditation? So first, you have to be good. By your goodness you pro pro bring about a good society. And if you are not good inside, good. I'm using that word specifically because it's not the goodness, be a good child. I don't mean that. We'll go into perhaps tomorrow or another day. But if there is not goodness in you, you cannot produce good society. And 
without goodness in you, you can meditate till you doomsday. Go to India, go to Tibet, where you visit various monasteries and attend various gurus who say this and who deny that. You know, play that game if it amuses you. But don't deceive yourself saying that's meditation, I'm meditating. Right? So if you have no love in your heart, what your, med what your meditation will be destructive. 